Welcome back to Open Space. This is Carter. I'm going to lead you through a little bit of a tour of the Milky Way galaxy thanks to the uh, Digital Universe uh, 3D Atlas uh, data sets. Digital Universe contains the data sets for the Milky Way from various astronomical catalogs uh, brought together into one and also the extragalactic or galaxy surveys beyond the Milky Way. So open space comes up once again with my left mouse and we'll move around Earth, uh, the daily image, um, and also defaulted are uh, defaulted to on are the paths or the trails uh, of the planets. So let me move around here and uh, see the sun. So what we see uh, is the sun, of course, uh, in our sky, and it moves through. Uh, the same patch of sky based on the sense that we go around the sun, we go around in a plane, which we call the ecliptic plane. And in order to illustrate the motion, what I can do is, let me just speed the Earth up. We start to see the Earth rotate. And if I rotate fast enough, we can see the other planets are moving, but we can also see the sun is moving. And if I let this continue, I'll sort of, the sun will move out of the, out of, uh, of the view. So what I'm going to do is, as we do this, I'll move these um, menus around. I'm going to open up the Milky Way data sets. And the first one are constellations. And what I'm going to do is open up the constellations subdirectory and enable the constellations. And what now I see are the point-to-point -point connections, the stellar positions that show the constellations. And, whoops, I just turned it off by mistake. Let me turn that back on. Oh, I hit the transparency. Oh, well, that's good to, actually, I, by mistake, I hit the transparency button. But that allows you to see, this is a slider, uh, hit the transparency slider. And so we can make them dominant or not. But as we see, just hovering above the Earth rotating quickly, is that we see the sun and the other planets all move through this section of sky and through these 12 red highlighted constellations. And uh, 12 because that uh, um, one for each month. So these are the zodiacal constellations that we see the sun move through. So that just sets us up in a way that uh, if we begin to move out, what I want to do is I'm going to pause time. I can pause time either over here and hit pause, or I could go slower, but I could also hit the space bar. That will stop time. So I've stopped time, and we will now move away from the Earth moon system. Once again, the right mouse uh, holding that down allows me to move out into the solar system. And so as I do, we can see the, the distant uh, glow of the sun now. Of course, the sun would dominate, and the sun would be the brightest thing we see. but. Uh, we now see the backdrop of constellations. One thing I'd like to do uh, to show you an advanced feature, which can be of, of use, is I'm going to hit the F3 key, which brings up our advanced menu, um, which I had my time controls next to. And I'm going to come down to the fourth entry. It says Global Properties. And if I turn that on, it pops up a submenu. And there are many different things to explore here. But the first thing I thought I would do is is just come down to this set of sliders under Render Engine. I'll open that. And amongst the various things, there's a background exposure. That's the third slider down. And I usually drag that up to about four. And when I do, this is going to enhance the background for us. And that's what we want to see. And then I can kind of get rid of this submenu. And so now we're seeing the solar system, the sun, the red zodiacal constellations as we move out. And as we move out, we might want to see the star labels uh, so that we can see what stars we're actually seeing. So to do that, I'll open up the stars menu. And there are stars labels. I'll come and enable them. And we can now see star labels. So in this case, you see some star labels are large and some are small. And you might say, well, why is that? Um, if I point out this beautiful constellation of the Scorpion right here, Scorpius, uh, and it's right next to the brightest section of the Milky Way, is that the prominent star Antares has kind of got some small 
typeface. Then there's a star with a larger typeface, maybe you've heard of or not, but Jabba. <laughs> and then there's Caus Borealis and Caus Australis over here. Well, the labels actually reflect perspective. These are stars that are closer. So Antares is actually about 300 light years away. It's a red giant. And it's still a prominent star, which means it's a very bright star and it's quite far away. But we're seeing these star labels because they are giving us an early indication of distance. So let's now move away from our solar system. I'm only 11 light days away from the sun. I gotta move away from the sun with my right mouse button. And when I get out here, there, at one light year, we now pop on the sun's glare as if it's just another star. And it's the brightest thing we see because we're close to it. At this point, we've moved far enough away to where I see uh, Proxima Centauri. So, okay, I can still use the uh, left mouse button to move around and we can now see the, um, the red zodiacal constellations. And we can see that Proxima has already moved away from its location, sort of on the wallpaper of sky, if you will. And we might be able to move down. There's a Southern Cross. I'm moving in this direction because I expect to see soon the star Sirius, which is eight and a half light years away, and Procyon, 11 light years away. So those are also close. So if I move about, we will see uh, it also drags the line, uh, show the constellation connection. But we can see that those stars are pretty close. If I come down here, here's Orion. It's laying on its side. If I want to turn it up, I can just depress the middle mouse uh, button, and that allows me to bring Orion. So Orion looks like he's standing up. Also, you'll notice some of the constellation lines might be uh, shimmering, may, might be flashing on and off. We're working on that. Um, so in this early version, I'm not sure if we'll get it fixed or not, but uh, that's okay for now. Um, and also, perhaps the star labels are too large. So bring up your menu. I have my stars open in, under my Milky Way category. I have my star labels, and if we come down uh, I can adjust the text maximum size, and I'm going to minimize that, so that, that has the effect of drawing these labels even smaller, so that they're not so dominant on the screen. But now we can see how the constellation lines will follow this perspective. If I move out even farther, oh boy, we can now see how the constellations all become this, uh, these, these lines, it makes sense from the Earth, but here they kind of point in perspective to where the sun is. Well, that gets rather confusing, so I usually at this point like to come up, turn the constellations off. So I, I turn their enabling off, and now I see the stars that we know and love in, uh, um, in uh, labels here. So this is our near field of stars we're seeing. Uh, them for what they are. If they're not bright enough, you say you want to see more stars, uh, I can do that. Just open up my stars category and grab the scale factor slider and I can brighten that up. So now we, the stars are more prominent out here and uh, so we see that. And you kind of say, well, okay, what does this mean? What I'd like to do is give us something that we're, perhaps we can appreciate um, within uh, our reach out into space. So what I'm going to do now is bring up underneath others slash grids, I can bring up the equatorial sphere and I enable it. So I open it up and there it is. If I don't like its color, it's a little too blue, I can come down, click on the color swatch, and I could brighten it up a little bit like so. Uh, that's fine, I changed its color. Um, also, if I don't like uh, a double line width, I come, come down, I kind of like a single line width. Let me get that down to... And so what this sphere represents is stretching the Earth's latitude and longitude out into space. In this case, this alliance is the center is the sun. Down here, as we see a tiny little label, says sun, that's at the center. 
And up here is a lines of the north celestial pole and the south celestial pole. But what's most important is we've given this a radius, and the radius is 75 light years. This represents how far our radio waves have traveled since the Earth became radio bright around the birth of radar and television carrier waves, basically around the time of World War II. So out here is how far our radio signals have reached, which means that these stars um, that uh, are labeled the ones that we see within the sphere, and actually if we want to just, another word to the wise is if you stop, everything seems to flatten out. To continue with a sort of a three-dimensional feel, all you gotta do is kind of rotate the camera a little bit. If you hit the F key, um, that, uh, that enables us to just keep moving. And so in that way, uh, now that uh, we can kind of tell what's close and what's far. So everything within the sphere has heard from us. Everything outside of the sphere has yet to hear from us. Well, what else is in this near field of stars? We've been discovering exoplanets. Open this up. The dynamically discovered exoplanets that we now see are here. In other words, these labels indicate star positions where there are stars that, uh, um, uh, that are host to planets. If we want to see their labels, we should be able to come down and turn their labels on as well. Oh boy, and they're too big. And so if they're too big, grab their scale factor here, or actually, no, scale factor would be the size of the, lay of the target. But if we come down here, the text Ma uh, maximum size, we want to make smaller, and in that way, we can make the label small. Now this is an example of what I consider a bad map. There's too much information on here. Uh, unless you want to read the individual labels, uh, come up here, I'm just going to turn those labels back off, and we're just showing where the exoplanets are. So now if I pull out in this broader perspective, we can see that this radio sphere 75 light years in radius, a tremendous distance, but we're moving out into the Milky Way galaxy and that we will see that in fact this is actually pretty small. This is a very small portion of the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy is a big flat barred spiral galaxy that its diameter is about 100,000 light years. This is really just 150 light years in diameter. Once again, 75 light years in radius. I'm going to turn off the dynamical exoplanets. I'm just going to collapse the exoplanets down. And I want to move in a little closer. If I do, if I move around the outside of the radio sphere with the beautiful uh, bright section of the Milky Way that corresponds to Scorpius Sagittarius region. And we see that in view. That means that we're moving out into the opposite side of the sky that we think of. And now for the northern hemisphere, that bright section of the Milky Way we think of as summer. If you were in Australia, it would be winter. But uh, uh, for the seasonality in the northern hemisphere, we think of this beautiful bright section of the Milky Way that we see in the summer. So if I'm moving away from the sun to the opposite side of the sky, I'm moving into the constellations that we consider the winter constellations. And as I do that, we will find the Hyades star cluster. And it's at 150 light years away. The Hyades um, are what we associate uh, with the face of Taurus the Bull. In fact, it's kind of a V-shape of stars, as we see here. We're seeing it from the opposite side. But this is really the nearest um, well-defined star cluster to us, 150 light years away. So it's twice the distance of the edge of the radiosphere. In fact, from Earth, we see this V-shape of stars crowned by a prominent red star that we know of as Aldebaran. And so Aldebaran is right here. And if I come close to Aldebaran, we can see that it is just about on the edge of the radiosphere. Uh, Aldebaran is just hearing um, 
the early uh, signals from Earth corresponding around the time of World War II. If I continue moving out, I should encounter the heart of Taurus the Bull, another star cluster, very well known as the Pleiades. And here we see the Pleiades. They are even farther away. They're 400 light years away. If you had a really good telescope and you were orbiting, say, one of these stars out here and you look back to Earth, you'd see the Earth 400 years ago. What happened on Earth 400 years ago, there was a gray-haired guy with a beard with the first telescope looking at the sky, Galileo. So if you're out here, you'd see the Earth 400 years ago, at the time Galileo was looking back at you. So I'm talking about these star clusters. This is useful for us to see basically the begin to understand the galaxy in terms of different types of data. So let's consider the star clusters as categories. First thing I'm going to do is now the star names are sort of, you know, we've seen them. I'm going to turn those labels off. Star labels, turn them off. So now we just see the radiosphere. The Hyades cluster that I talked about is down here. But that will be emphasized if I turn on those star cluster categories. We call them open clusters. Uh, they're also called galactic clusters. I turn on these things and now we see, oh wow, the screen fills up with a whole bunch of dots. If they're too big, I can scale them down a bit. So I'm going to scale them. There's a scale factor, scale slider. And we can now see there's the Hyades. There's the Pleiades. And we can also see that as a category, if I just move about, that they tend to be contained uh, close to the Milky Way. So open clusters, uh, meaning that they're kind of loose clusters. We see much tighter clusters, and we call them globular clusters. Um, I also mentioned that we call these open clusters galactic clusters because they are constrained pretty much to the Milky Way band. I'm now going to turn on the globular star clusters. They tend to be farther away. And I'm just going to come up here. Globular clusters open up this category. And I will enable it. And we get these yellow pentagons. Now, OK, uh, they also seem a little large. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab their scale factor. I'm going to uh, make them a little smaller. Now, notice how you see many yellow triangle or yellow pentagons, sorry, in this direction. But if I look away, I hardly see any. This was noticed by astronomers that these different types of star clusters, and especially these globular star clusters, tended to cluster around the brightest section of the Milky Way. Well, this has a story to tell us. Let's move out farther away to gain a, a, a broader perspective. Now we can see how the globular clusters really exist toward that bright section of the Milky Way. And now, from this distant view, we can see how the open or galactic clusters really are constrained pretty much into a plane. We don't see too many up here or down here, but we see lots of them along this plane. I'm going to bring up another data set to show you where stars are born. This is where we typically see like a nebula, like the Orion Nebula or the Lagoon Nebula where stars are being born. And we can look at these typically tracked in radio light, but uh, we can now see where these stellar birth regions are, and in blue, in these blue hexagons. And with this, this traces out a much broader census of the Milky Way galaxy. And if I move out far enough, we will see our image, our stand-in. For us, it's NGC 1232. It's not our Milky Way galaxy, but since we're inside our Milky Way galaxy, we use another galaxy, which we know to be kind of similar to the Milky Way as our stand-in, as our proxy. So with that, we have moved out from the Earth, seeing the organization of our solar system and the constellations that surround us and then the exoplanets that are in close to us, our radiosphere, and that uh, 
now we've moved out so far that we can see now with these the tails of two different types of star clusters and then the stellar birth regions that we can see within this data, the data gives us this view of the Milky Way. If I wanted to make this image of our stand in the Milky Way a little dimmer, I can do that. Its image is actually, we put that into the universe category under galaxies. So once again, I want to dim this image of our galaxy and you go up to Milky Way galaxy image and it's enabled, I can turn it on and off. Let's say I want to leave it on and I just want to bring its transparency down. I can do that. Once again, let's just move slowly in toward the Earth. As we do the, the galaxy image sort of, uh, we're doing a transition between it and the backdrop that we see of the Milky Way band. Now let's just come closer and closer and just searching for our tiny radio sphere in the Milky Way galaxy, of which we're in the center. Remember, I brightened the stars for us to see. Once again, the Hyades star cluster. We're coming in closer to it, 150 light years. The red star Aldebaran, we're at 75 light years. And now coming back to a dim little star that we call the sun our home. If I really push fast, that's going to go. It toggles away at about a light year out. And now we're coming in to the view of the trails of the solar system. And of course, the third one out has a little uh, rocky moon orbiting us. And here are the farthest humans have ever been away. Finally coming up on this view of our lovely Earth in context. So with that, it's kind of a longer video here, but gives you a sense of how to open up these menus and go through some of the data, turn them on and off and adjust them, scale them, brighten them, make them more transparent, however you will. Um, but it gives you a sense of the Milky Way galaxy. Thank you.